so I was meant to, I think, introduce the ideas of pixels and object classifiers, but I was thinking it might be quite useful to try and, um, yeah, so I thought it might help to give a kind of a overview of the concepts and how things fit together within QPath, because I think these have changed a little bit over the years, but I think core to the whole software working at all is that it tries to have this kind of unified approach to how you um, work with images and it's different from another software. So it was one of the fundamental things that made QPath worth developing, but also one of the fundamental things that's important to know about um, whenever you're using it to see how it relates to anything else. Okay. And I thought as well, it would be good to give just a general overview of some terms that we will use and in this talk, but also have been used elsewhere. Um, and so here's a simple illustration of an image analysis pipeline where you have images go in and you can treat it as a black box where some kind of stuff happens and then results come out at the other end. And what I would like to do in the next couple of slides is to explain some of the stuff that happens. I should also say that I put together this presentation this morning, um, so I don't necessarily know what's gonna appear in the next slide, um, because I finished it in the last five minutes. <laughs> Um, or may finish it in the future. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that happens um, in the, the image processing. It's not such a black, black box, so it becomes a little bit more transparent. Um, again, this is probably familiar, um, and I think it was mentioned a little bit yesterday. Images are composed of pixels. You'll have heard the word all of the time. I don't know if you've heard that it means it comes from picture elements. It's not crucial that you know it, but it's basically a pixel is a fundamental building block. Um, but what it is crucial to keep in mind is that a pixel is just a number. And all that we are doing here is um, looking for patterns within these numbers and then making some kind of summaries um, of the patterns that we find within the numbers. And we talk about image analysis and talk about image processing. Sometimes they are used more or less synonymously, but they aren't actually quite the same. So image processing is kind of what helps you to achieve analysis. So for image analysis, you can think your images go in, results come out like summary measurements. For image processing, images go in, a different image comes out. Um, so you use image processing in order to do analysis. And to see how that works, um, here I've got an example uh, image, one of the key 67 images. So this is called an RGB image, image, which basically means that we have three color channels, red, green, and blue. And for each one of these pixels here, you can think of it as having three values, one for the amount of red light, one for green light, and one for blue light, which then mix together to give you the color that you see on screen. And so, yeah, you can think of it effectively as being three values for each of the pixels here. Um, but because these are just numeric values, we can easily do stuff like let's just average them. So instead of taking the red, green, and blue, blue values and then mixing them to give colors, why do we not just average the three values? And then we've essentially thrown away the color information and that's what we have. And what if we then don't average across the red, green and blue, but let's say we average around neighboring values in here. And so we take each pixel and then we replace it by the average of itself and its neighbors. And maybe we will weight that average a little bit so the pixels that are further away don't influence it as much. And essentially we end up with a smoother looking image like this. And so this is an example of image processing because an image goes in, you do something to it, and an image comes out the other end. And in this case, all we did was average, so it's additions and multiplications, so it's just simple arithmetic, but it's fundamentally transformed the image. Having done that, what if we were to then subtract that image from the one that we had before? So again, it's just arithmetic, um, but we subtract the corresponding pixel values. Um, so the ones after averaging were the ones before averaging, and this is what we get. And I hope you can see that already starts to look like it could be useful because that already starts to help the nuclei kind of pop out a little bit from the background. This image also has some nice properties in that the overall average is zero. It doesn't really matter what you started with. The overall mean of this is zero, um, which is probably not the case with any arbitrary image you get. You don't know what the, the mean is going to be. And so you can start to get some nice properties whenever you do these processing operations. What you also might do is you might take one pixel value and subtract the one above it, for example, or subtract the one to the, the left. Uh, in this case, it's subtract one above it. And so these just give you images that look a little bit different, but you can combine them creatively. So let's take the last two images that we got. 
square the values, add them together, and it becomes a bit like Pythagoras' theorem, and then we just square with the result, and we have an age-enhanced image. So all of these operations are mathematically really, really simple, but because they're applied to an enormous number of pixels, and we can visualize the result, then you see that they start to accent and highlight things that could be useful for us. And so QPath watershed cell detection is basically made up of these kind of things. And so this was what I spent most of the, my career, certainly the, the first half of it, is figuring out what are the steps that you need to do in order to be able to um, come up with detecting the structures you need and measuring them. So it's these kind of steps are used. Um, slight bit of trivia, it's not exactly this, um, but I, I spoke a little bit yesterday about why the cell detection in Cupa, it sort of decouples the threshold from the size of things, because um, it's using this kind of trick, which whenever you go from positive to negative values, then you get that defines an age. And so it uses these kind of um, yeah, tricks in order to be able to figure out this is what an age is, and that's independent of your threshold for detecting stuff. Uh, probably didn't need to know that, but yeah, those are the kind of tricks that have defined my career up until uh, recent times. So yeah, um, image processing and along the path to analysis, it's kind of a bit of an art and a bit of a science because it's anything that you can do with an image. Um, you could do anything with these numbers, but it's trying to figure out creatively what is meaningful to do in order to detect and um, assess what you want in the end. And QPath tries to shield you from having to do the details of that. If you work with image J, you really get to go into the details because you can combine these um, little operations. Whereas QPath tries to have the predefined algorithm with all of these processing operations in place so that you just press a button, then you get the results. What makes things particularly difficult is that pathology images are big. And I showed this slide yesterday, a single image could easily be 60 gigabytes of uncompressed data. And what was mentioned, uh, I think a couple of times is that these images are pyramidal images. And what that essentially means is that you have the image data stored at multiple resolutions, so like multiple magnifications. Um, so you could have a very uh, large, uh, the full resolution image, and then you have a zoomed out version and a zoomed out version. And all of these are broken into little square tiles. So QPath needed to be written in order to be able to work with this data because we couldn't read the entire 60 gigabyte image in one go. The performance would be terrible and it would if, you, if your computer is 8 or 16 gigabytes of RAM, you're just not going to be able to get squeeze 60 gigabytes into that. So what QPath has to do is that depending upon the part of the image you care about to visualize or analyze, um, it needs to go in and pull out the square tiles that are relevant for the current processing. It has to do it very, very quickly, and it has to be able to rescale them to sort of pretend like you have all possible resolutions, even though it's actually um, stored just at certain discrete levels. So this is what an image pyramid is, and this is why um, QPath had to be written from scratch with a, a new viewer for working with these, um, because yeah, the images are quite complex and awkward. But the goal of analysis, I said, is to get summary numbers at the end, but I also said that the input images are just pixels, so they're just numbers, um, but the scale's quite different. So you could think of a typical whole slide image, you could have maybe 60 billion numbers. Um, and my calculation there, someone can check it and tell me if I got it wrong. Um, so basically I'm thinking that you could have the width is 200,000 pixels, the height to 100,000 pixels. So you multiply those together, it gives you the number of pixels. But I said you get three values for the red, green, and blue. So we can multiply that by three. And so we end up with an absolutely enormous um, number of numbers uh, that we're working with. And for analysis, maybe one <laughs> a kind of cells or a percentage of positive cells. And so what we really want at the end is maybe one, two, three, four, five numbers, and we have about 60 billion or so going in. So we have to do a pretty dramatic um, summary, summarization along the way. And this is where I want to be able to explain how Cooper approaches that, because going in one step is not very feasible. We need to somehow be able to break this down. And QPath's approach to break it down is that you go from your original image with your millions, if not billions, of values, and then you create an object representation of that. So you've heard the word term object many, many times um, the last day or two. And then we query that object representation in order to get the results at the end. And that's what this presentation is explaining um, how, this, how this works. 
Well, one crucial thing to, to think about is that once you have this object representation, like all of your cells and so on, that can exist entirely independently of the pixels. And that enables QPath to work quickly and to be able to give you results very quickly because it creates this kind of intermediate representation, which is a summary of the data. We haven't gone from 60 billion numbers to, um, to six, but we have gone from 60 billion numbers to maybe um, a few thousand or so um, to represent the objects. And then we can go to the final step of summarizing that. So then what is an object? And feel free to stop and ask me questions along the way if anything's not clear. Um, so informally, you can just think of an object as being anything of interest in the image. It could be a cell, it could be a nucleus. An object is a really general concept. Um, and what it exactly is depends upon what you care about measuring and what's in your image. But from QPath's perspective, each object is kind of rigorously defined in terms of the properties that it has. And so it has a region of interest. And so that's like a little polygon that we get in here, or it could be the square. So that defines the region of the image that we care about. Each object has a list of measurements. And we'll look at that a little bit uh, later. Um, QPath can also dynamically calculate some measurements, but Objects have a stored list of measurements as well, which don't, uh, which aren't calculated live. They're just fixed and assigned as properties of the object. Um, so region of interest, we have measurements and we have a classification, um, which could be say tumor, stroma, lymphocyte, um, but it could also be a mixture of things. So it could be tumor positive or tumor negative or tumor one plus two plus three plus if you do this a intensity gradation thing. So classifications can contain multiple pieces of information, but it's encapsulated in this one thing of a classification. You can have extra properties. So you could have a name um, for your object. You could have a color. Usually you won't. Uh, those tend to be more if you're wanting to create annotations just to, to visualize stuff, but not do any real analysis. For real analysis, um, classifications tend to be much more important. And often these things are just not set. Um, whenever the objects are visualized on the image, uh, QPath will be drawing uh, a shape that corresponds to the region of interest, and it will assign a color based upon the classification or the color variable, depending upon which of those is available. I think if they're both set, then the color will take over, but in general, you will only set one of them, and then the color that you actually see will be based upon that. So here, um, I used a classification, so red indicates tumor positive, um, blue indicates tumor negative, and then the different shades of green are, are non-tumor positive and negative. And so the color tends to come from the classification, but you could set it if you wanted. Um, and these are all properties of the object. And then finally, um, two other properties which are quite important, um, but less important than they used to be, is that each object can have a parent object and it can also have a list of child objects. So there's this kind of uh, family relationship between the objects potentially. Um, but again, that's something that you can often ignore. Uh, so the things that you generally can't ignore is the region of interest, because that really defines what you're looking at and where it is. And you usually can't ignore the classification, but the other things you might not necessarily have to care about very much. Okay. And these things can be visualized within the QPath region, or, um, user interface. So if I click on the hierarchy tab, so this family relationship, basically it's, it's an object hierarchy for QPath. So we have um, one object at the very top, and then we have children of that, and then their children, their children, and so on. Um, and so that's visualized in this hierarchy tab. And then the measurements are visualized here for the object, which is currently selected. And then there are different types of objects, um, which is something that is perhaps, yeah, not so obvious why that would be, um, but it is actually quite crucial to keep up working at all. Um, there's different types of objects, uh, but there's two main distinctions. The, the one distinction that you need to make is really between annotation objects and detection objects, because these are implemented differently and they are yeah, crucial to QPath working. So an annotation is basically something which is really flexible. You can have a region of interest and um, within this annotation, but then you can modify it. and um, yeah, so you can dynamically change it. Like when you're drawing with a brush tool, you might have an annotation and then you, you adjust the way that it looks. 
Uh, and these are typically used for defining large regions of interest. So if you know the ImageJ software, um, basically its ROIs are quite close to annotations, except QPath does things differently because ImageJ's ROIs have a zillion other properties, which we could not possibly work with in QPath because it would mean that you couldn't work with millions of cells in the image. It would just um, really not work at all. Um, so QPath has a really stripped down, uh, more rigorously defined way of working with these objects, but an, an image J ROI is close to a QPath annotation in that it's flexible and you can edit it. But a QPath annotation has these additional properties stored with it, like measurements. It's quite heavy in terms that an annotation, if you had, you could maybe work with a thousand, ten thousand annotations and that would be fine. If you try to work with a million of them, QPath will grind to a halt, and that kind of was mentioned earlier. Um, you can also have QPath grind to a halt if you have one annotation, but it has, is a, like a crazily complex polygon with a million vertices, then that is also quite difficult because annotations are redrawn every time you do something in QPath. So let's suppose that I um, draw this. So as I zoom in and as I zoom out, that is redrawn on screen every single time um, that I do anything. And as I uh, move around, it has to be redrawn every single time. And it might not be entirely obvious why, but the thickness of this line remains the same. And that's why we have to redraw every time. Um, so as you zoom out, you can still see it because the thickness remains the same. The other type of object that you need to care about are detections, and that doesn't happen. So you should see that as I zoom in on the detection, the lines get thicker. And as I zoom out, they get thinner. Because annotations are typically for defining large regions um, that you might want to detect things within. And there you need to be able to see, the, see them whenever you're zoomed out. Whereas detections are designed for representing, say, a million, two million cells. And in that case, if the line thickness stayed the same when you zoomed out, your image would just be an incomprehensible mess. It would just be lines everywhere um, and you wouldn't see anything at all. And so detections are for representing these very small things. You might have very many of them. Um, they're really lightweight, so they use as little memory as possible. I was doing my calculations for exactly how many bytes an object is going to, uh, a detection is going to require and try and make it squeeze it down to as minimalist as possible because um, that's necessary for QPath to be able to handle really complex images with really large numbers of detections. Um, and yeah. As they zoom out, um, QPath will actually paint them in a much kind of, not necessarily a smarter way, but it will mean that as I'm zooming out, it's actually able to take the detections that were drawn at some other resolution and then update the screen. So it's able to repaint a million detections quite quickly, mm -hmm. whereas a million annotations it couldn't because it would have to draw every one individually and make sure it's got the right line thickness every time. And so they are quite different in terms of their performance in QPath, and they're different in terms of what you use them for. Yes. So here is an annotation which is um, pretty complex. QPath could still probably handle it, but it has a huge number of vertices in here. Um, and as you can see, the QPath can, I mean, it can handle uh, thousands of vertices pretty, pretty well. But there is a command. Uh, The command was simplify shape, and that is when you have a gazillion vertices and your annotation is really complex. I will click on this. Uh, choose one, probably doesn't look remotely different, but it's probably thrown away a lot of vertices that weren't doing very, lot, very much there. Let's choose 10, and we might start to see a difference. No, almost not. Oh, no. Um, okay. Made that a little bit bigger than I intended. I'm not going to go straight to 5,000. Let's try 100 now. OK, it starts to change. Um, so yeah, this is whenever you have a really complex shape and you want to be able to simplify it a little bit. Um, that will remove some of the vertices while still keeping pretty much the same shape. Um, there, if you were looking on the forum recently, there was a complaint about how QPath calculates the perimeters of things. Um, and that is, yeah, that could potentially be resolved 
if you simplify the shape, because if you have a perimeter of a shape and it's very boxy because it's all based upon pixels, then simplifying can give you a straight line, for example. And maybe that gives you better perimeter measurements than if you calculate your straight line uh, pixel by pixel. Uh, slight, yeah. Oh, that sort of helps answer a little bit. Um, if that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry about it because probably don't need it. Um, but yeah, if you find that you have an enormously complex annotation and QPath is slowing down, then that simplified thing will um, hopefully improve QPath performance. But yes, we have these two fundamentally different objects used for fundamentally different things. Um, annotations for your larger regions, they're editable, they're flexible. Detections are really um, lightweight. You can have millions of them, but the cost of that is that you can't edit them. Um, and that is sometimes unpopular, but there are, there are ways around everything more or less in QPath. The, if you had detections, you could script it, you could convert them by annotations, edit them, convert them back. But it's not a good thing to do that routinely, and QPath doesn't try to make that too easily because you can easily end up with unexpected consequences. So if you run cell detection in QPath, at the time when it detects the cells, it also measures them. So if you were able to then change your cell shape, the measurements won't up automatically update um, because that cell detection was all run in the past. So you'd end up with shapes that don't correspond to what's measured. And then QPath would have to maybe deal with that and update automatically and it would become vastly more complex. So the solution is that you just have to create a new detection somehow. Um, and so it doesn't make it super easy to edit them for performance reasons and just for not creating a horrible complex mess. So if you need an editable shape, you want annotations. If you want a fast, lightweight shape that you can have a lot of, you need uh, detections. There are some special types, um, cells or a special subtype of detections where you can have a nucleus as well as a, a main boundary, but it is just a detection. Um, tiles are, we'll see them a little bit tomorrow. They're also just detections, but they typically, they might be used like if you want to calculate textures across a large region and break it into little squares. So each little square doesn't correspond to a meaningful entity like a cell or a gland or a vessel. Um, it's just a arbitrary kind of region. So that's what the tiles are to represent, but they're, they're detections. And TMA cores are for tissue microarrays, um, uh, which I don't think we're going to look at really much here, but they're, they behave a bit like annotations, but tissue microarrays, we, they force you to have a grid and then the, the cores should be circular and stuff. So there's some other caveats, but they are a, a bit more like annotations. Um, but yeah. The main things that you need to worry about are annotations and detections, uh, and then cells and tiles are just special examples of detections. And then I said that there's parent-child thing because the um, objects are arranged in a hierarchy, so you can think of it, here is what, so green here, or red here represents um, an annotation, the larger circles and the smaller ones are detections. So this is an annotation, and it has two child objects and they're both annotations. And this one has three child objects that are annotations and one that's a detection. And then these have their parents as well if you go back. And at the very top of the hierarchy, um, you have what QPath calls the root object, which you almost never have to care about. Um, but it's basically QPath stores. Everything has to be, every object has to be a child of another object unless it's the root. Um, and that means that if you want to represent every object in QPath, all you need to do it, within an image, you just need to see of the root because you can reach every other object through that. But that's a slightly more technical thing you don't need to care about. Um, but if you don't have any objects selected in here, um, QPath will say that you just have the image because the root is basically representing your entire image. And that's why you can still see some measurements in there because internally QPath is treating it as like this one is selected instead. But yeah, um, slightly technical detail that you probably won't have to care about, except very occasionally if you're scripting something uh, custom. Okay, so a basic analysis workflow then is we have to somehow, yeah, we want to go from our input image with our billions of values, and we want to have our summary measurements of just a few values. We can just somehow get there. I said that QPath does this intermediate representation of an object. So the big thing that you need to think about when you're analyzing images QPath is how do you get that object representation? And then how do you query it at the end? So we need to take our image, somehow create objects 
often we need to make measurements of those objects and often we need to classify those objects and then then we query them uh so we pretty much always have to create objects pretty much always have to query them um the measuring and classifying is going to depend upon what you care about so for example if you just wanted to count cells in an image um with the example i showed yesterday you wouldn't necessarily have to measure them you wouldn't have to classify them you just count everything that you detected um so these two are optional but common um classifying the creating objects and querying them are typically uh required for analysis in QPath. so that's how you could visualize it we have our original image we have our object-based representation and we have the results at the end and if we then view how that fits with these steps from our original image somehow we create objects from that and that could be done, for example, by running cell detection, where QPath will use all of those processing tricks that I showed before, but you don't have to care about it because I wrote them years ago. Um, so that's all there. It gives you your objects at the end. Then QPath will take those objects and relate them back to the original image, um, and it will make measurements of those objects. And this is all built into the cell detection command as well, so you don't need to worry about it. It will automatically make these measurements. And then based upon that, you would often then put that into a cell classifier, which is able to take the objects and the corresponding measurements and then figure out um, one way or another, and you're going to see it soon how, um, potentially. Uh, it's going to figure out how to classify the cells, in this case, a tumor versus non-tumor. And then you might apply that multiple times. So for example, you might have a one cell classifier higher for tumor versus non-tumor and another one for positive versus negative. Uh, because QPath is designed to be flexible, you can also shift these orders a little bit. You could do the intensity classification for positive and negative first, and then the cell classification afterwards. The order is not so important, um, but the key thing is that we have detected the objects and then we have classified by intensity and um, the cell type in order to be able to get these results at the end. And these results are generated simply by querying this representation. And at that point, um, the querying does not have to care that it came from original pixels. It's simply querying the objects and that's what enables it to be fast. So in this case, it's having to count up um, the number of cells, which are detections, which have classifications of different types and then summarize them. Uh, that in a hopefully meaningful way. So the object classifier then, um, as we come to an end, is basically what you use at this stage. So cell detection, for example, will give you this, um, and it will give you the measurements. We need to somehow do the classification, and that's what an object classifier is for. We take our inputs of the images and measurements that we got from cell detection, put them into the object classifier, and then we get the classifications at the end. And this typically uses a kind of machine learning, but it doesn't have to. You could use a simple threshold, but if a class of, if um, a value is like a, a DAB, optical density value, is greater than 0 0.2, it's positive. If it's less than 0 0.2, it's negative. So it could be a simple rule like that, or it could be a whole random forest classifier trained upon thousands of examples. And so the object classifier itself can be simple or complex, but it always serves this purpose of taking your objects and assigning classifications to them. And you can do it um, multiple times if need be. So here we had, previously I gave it unclassified objects as input. In this case, I've given it classified as tumor and non-tumor, put it through another object classifier, and then it assigns the additional classification as um, positive or negative. And lastly then, uh, so you, you're gonna see that in action, lastly, uh, we have the idea of a pixel classifier, and it uses the same idea, or the same term classifier, because it is the same fundamental idea. But it's important to know that the pixel classifier isn't classifying your objects, which is hopefully clear from the fact that it's not an object classifier. It's rather classifying your pixels um, as to belonging to something or other, so that could be positive, negative, tumor, non-tumor, whatever. Um, but essentially, we have our pixels here. The pixel classifier, um, as a pre-processing step, it can do these processing operations that I showed before to calculate lots of different image representations. And then it uses those as the input for its machine learning or its threshold. And then in the end, gives you a result, like for every pixel that this particular pixel is positive, negative, tumor, stroma, whatever. Um, 
but the purpose of that is that if you have the classified pixels, you can then keep up and then trace around them to generate objects. So if we fit that into our workflow, um, you might use a pixel classifier at this step in order to create the objects, um, but you'd use an object classifier at this step. And then, yeah, that's how the, it all fits together. You may or may not ever need to use a pixel classifier because maybe cell detection is good enough for you, or you can you're happy to draw your original objects yourself. Um, but those are that's the general workflow is pretty much constant of an image to create objects somehow, measure objects somehow, and classify them somehow, and then query them. And if you can sort of internalize that framework in your mind, then it might make more sense whenever you see the things happening. And then you can see where does it fit into this kind of um, process. 